A little bit about what's going to be discussed today, a little outline, uh, our purpose, our global and societal impacts, our marketing and engineering specifications, system description, both hardware and software, and in comparison to existing work. A little bit about our team. I myself am Michael Kelly, the team leader, and I was in charge of 3D modeling and software alongside my colleague, Subhash Limbu, which also dealt with 3D modeling and software. And on the hardware team, we had Dean Riccio and Ifani Obikwe, who both dealt with PCB design and hardware design. So the purpose of our project is essentially to create a prosthetic hand that is lightweight and portable and also cost effective, seeing as many prosthetic hands currently in the industry often cost tens of thousands of dollars. So we want to essentially create a cost effective method for our users. Here's a little bit about the background of our project. So Ambryos Pear was one of the first doctors to introduce a hinge prosthetic hand during the 16th century which I found really interesting in terms of the development as to how prosthetic hands were created. Our project is based off a prosthetic gripper made by Manhattan College alumni in 2017. We felt that while the 3D model of the prosthetic hand itself was very impressive, the hardware was quite lacking in the sense that the user would have to carry around wires along with the breadboard and a charger in order to operate the hand. So we wanted to make it portable and rechargeable and a lot smaller. Alongside the use of the prosthetic limb, we also like to include uh, drone technology. While it's a relatively new con uh, concept, uh, many companies are using it for, as it's in the forefront for alternative transportation of goods. However, we plan to implement the technology as a service to people in need. In the field of prosthetic gripper, autonomous grasping is one of the emerging technologies. It provides less operator interaction with deep reinforced learning algorithm for dexterous manipulation. As you can see in the image on the right, top right, is the Cartman designed by Australian students who won the 2017 Amazon Robotics Challenge. And as you can see in the bottom right, I mean bottom right here, yeah, uh, which is the UC Berkeley's Auto Lab reinforced by DexNet Deep Algorithm. Next slide, please. To go deeper to what the technology uses, the Cartman uses simple linear motion using suction gripper and claw gripper with deep, deep learning, which helps to differentiate the materials of the object. As you can see on the top right picture, it uses grasping algorithm and image to detect the best grasping point to pick the objects. And the bottom right is the DeckNet, is a collection of algorithm that uses different image and data online to grasp the different form of ob objects. Next slide. Please. In the autonomous robotic grasping, there are two main topics that researchers look upon. There, they are grasping perception and cognition grasping. Grasping perception where different motion and control are operated reliably in a known or unknown process, I mean, environment, cognition grasping, where all the database approaches to deep learning capacity of the gripper is observed. As you can see in the table of the comparison between two technologies, 3D DexNet has 3D manipulation and Cartman has pick and place objects as a robot. And limitation of these two technologies includes like for DexNet was not able to grass deform or reflective material due to less database and carbon design is cumbersome and quite large. So for the project selection, we initially had a couple different ideas as to what we wanted to do for Capstone. One of these ideas included creating COVID-19 test stations involving drones. However, this was scrapped early on in development. Another idea we had was creating a prosthetic gripper from scratch. But due to time constraints and the fact that we're not exactly mechanical engineers and it's quite difficult to create a prosthetic hand, we decided to use a four prong gripper. However, this used a DC motor. And since we're using a servo, we had to find a prosthetic gripper that we could adjust to fit our servo that we're using with the measurements. Our objective uh, is to try to con contribute to society and help people uh, by developing our knowledge and expertise in the uh, respective industries that we're going to be involved in, uh, try to construct a device capable of satisfying consumer needs uh, while responding to emergency situations as well as a prosthetic drone unit.
So for the marketing requirements, what I decided to do was create a form and ask people what they expected in terms of features and functionality of a prosthetic hand. And based on the form that I created, these were the top five most important features. Mobility, humanly shaped, strength detection, flexibility, and cost. So if we look here, then I took the marketing requirements, created engineering requirements and a justification as a result of these marketing and engineering requirements. So for example, the cost, Many, as I mentioned previously, many prosthetic hands are often very, very expensive, often costing tens of thousands of dollars. So by using plastic or a similar material to print out the 3D model itself that we made altercations to, this will allow the overall cost of our prosthetic device to reduce significantly compared to what's already on the market. For our marketing to engineering trade-off matrix, we considered uh, the engineering requirements we determined from earlier from the marketing requirements and we decided to put them against each other to try to see the relationship between the two. Uh, we thought that increasing the articulation of our device would uh, significantly increase cost, so therefore it had a negative correlation between the two, uh, seeing as we'd have to pur purchase some sophisticated uh, components to try to improve our, uh, sorry, the articulation of our design. For the needs identification as well, we compared the engineering requirements uh, within, uh, against each other individually to see which would be the most important thing to invest more time and effort into uh, during our design. A justification then is the reason how we came up with this idea. We noticed that there was a high cost in producing these prosthetic limbs, as well as multiple tragic accidents that result in the loss of hands and unfortunate deaths in the fireman industry which both led to improvements in the prosthetic industry where, where alternatives of materials and production have been created, which resulted in our um, solution for the problem. So for the system description in terms of hardware, me and Gerald broke up the prosthetic hand hardware needed for our project into several different subject, subsections as seen on this slide. So here is a overall picture of the schematic that me and Gerald created. Uh, I want to keep in mind that although our 3D model was based off of an existing model, this was made entirely from scratch. So here is a description of the schematic itself. To the left, there's a charging circuit with ESD protection. In the middle, there's a microcontroller unit with ESP32 connector. And on the right, there's a boost converter with a servo output. So the way that this operates is the USB is mainly used to charge the 3.7 LiPo battery along with program the microcontroller unit. And this LiPo battery is also connected to a protection integrated circuit, which then protects the battery from discharging or uh, catching on fire and exploding. And this battery is also connected to a boost converter, which outputs five volts and a set amount of current so that the boost converter can power the microcontroller, the SP32 connector, along with the servo motor. So here's the PCB that me and Gerald have essentially laid out. It's a four layer board and we were able to determine the layout through some research along with the trace widths needed to ensure current and uh, functionality of each component. And also by reading the, the data sheets and the recommended values, we made sure to label the components so that if there were any issues that occurred when building the PCB, we could easily troubleshoot them. When selecting the values of our components, we considered the battery consumption of the server motor. Uh, so we looked at the properties of the boost converter and we wanted to determine uh, certain values like the capacitors for the capacitors and resistors they were going to be using for the layout of the server motor, uh, sorry, the boost converter rather. And if you take a look at the figure there with the graph, uh, it explains the power efficiency to output current for the inductors at a 4.7 micro uh, Henry capacitor. Uh, we can see that if the, uh, because our server motor has a typical output operating current of about 250 milliamps, if we use the 4.7 microfarad cap uh, Henry capacitor rec recommended by uh, the manufacturers for the uh, boost converter, we would be having essentially a 60% power efficiency for our server motor, uh, which is uh, typical, which is terrible. Uh, so we considered increasing the peak inductor current limit for our inductor. And that way, that would significantly increase the power efficiency of our boost, of, uh, boost converter, rather. The quick overview of the functionality of our components, we have a flex sensor constantly checking for new finger position, 
and if it detects a new finger position, the ESP32 sends that information wirelessly to the claw portion of our design, which adjusts the servo position depending on the value that is being, that is being uh, received. As a hardware design implementation, Dean Ruscio explained the claw gripper hardware with the, 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 volt, the LiPo battery DC to DC converter, which powers the ESP32 and Pro Micro, as well as the servo motors and the 3D printed claw gripper. And on the wireless gloves aspect of our design, it is also using a 3.7 volt with a five uh, DC to DC boost converter to five volts, which powers the ESP32. However, instead of the Pro Micro being powered by the ESP32, it controls three flex sensors, which is used for monitoring movement. For the software implementation, it initially starts off with the ESP32 turning on, a serial communication with a baud rate of 115,200, and the initialization of the ESP32 as a Wi-Fi station, which listens for any incoming messages from other ESP32s. If it receives one, the information is sent from one ESP32 wirelessly to the other ESP32 and changing the position of the servo. For the glove portion of and slash sleeve portion of our design, uh, similarly, the ESP32 is turned on and initializes a Wi-Fi transmitter. However, the ESP32 uh, solely focuses on um, inspecting values from the e flex sensors. And if it detects a change in value, the information is then passed along wirelessly to the other ESP32. As, as Dean has mentioned, that our four-prone gripper did not cooperate with our PCB design due to the DC motor use but we were able to design a 3D model that can implement with our standard motor, uh, motor here. <coughs> we redesigned on 3D model to fit our design using 3D modeling software, where the top plates and the spaces dimension were reconfigured to adjust our standard servo. As we can see in the image, the gripper consists of parallel draw that can man maneuver with the help of servo motor and the claw consists of eight 15 millimeter standoff to connect the top and bottom claw with the plates. Also the two three millimeter spacer to back to align the back plate in order. This is a breakdown of a prototype we created for function or testing functionality of all components as well as uh, connecting them all together where the top portion of the screen, the top right, is focusing on the ESP32 alongside the flex sensor, uh, which connects wirelessly to the second ESP32 located on the bottom left-hand side, which is connected then to the ProMicro, which powers the servo. The two charging ICs are meant for safe charging and discharging of the batteries without risk of exploding. And the DC to DC boost converter can be found at the very bottom of the screen, which in, takes the input voltage of 3.7 volts to 3.7 volts and boosts it to 5 volts for powering the components. A video demonstration of the software working can be seen in this video, where it showcases the ESP32 is communicating wirelessly, where the right hand side of the screen is the information being sent or transmitted from one ESP32 and the left-hand screen of the information being received. On the other side of the project, we have a flex sensor connected to an ESP32, which, as you can see, flexing the sensor produces different values, with starting at around 1,700, uh, 1700 and with depending on how far the PCB is flexed, uh, to around a value of about 400. So for the iterations to develop an optimal design, when me and Joe designed the PCB, we kept the design for manufacturability process in mind. What this means is wherever we're getting the PCB fabricated from, we need to make sure that all of the components along with the layer stack up and the general measurements needed to produce the board all fit in with the manufacturer's capabilities. Otherwise, the PCB will not be able to be produced. In testing results and analysis as seen in the videos, you can see the output of the flex sensors. Uh, see starting off at a value of around 1700 and dipping to around 600, depending on how far the PCB is flexed. The middle screenshot is the ESP32 uh, Arduino serial monitor, which is for the transmission of data. And on the right hand side screenshot is the reception of that information being passed along. 
So for the go, no go milestone, I think that we definitely reached our original 40% goal of the project being done with the fact that we created a working breadboard prototype along with the development of PC, uh, PCB with me and Gerald. And Michael and Subash found a 3D model that would suit our servo parameters along with creating the uh, individual testing for each component and seeing if the code was implemented with it correctly. So here's a project schedule of what we have accomplished and what's to come. So in the fall, we created the prototype, we created the uh, development of the PCB, along with ensuring that the eventual individual components work. In the winter, we are gonna get those PCBs fabricated, hand solder on the components, print the 3D model, along with begin development of the drone. And in the spring, we're gonna have a fully built drone along with the prosthetic hand, and then we are gonna essentially create them to work as one uniform system. Through our research, we have conducted uh, about a, a build that would cost, that would be the cost of functionality for all the components. We estimated to be around $350, with the most expensive portion being the Ender 3 3D printer. The inclusion of this was because we do not have access to 3D modeling um, fabrication. So we included it. However, in the event that we do happen to come across a 3D printer, the price would come down exponentially. Uh, for the drone portion of it, due to, due to it being a relatively new technology, uh, we have concluded to be around $325. As for working for this project, our system was able to cooperate with wireless communication and PCB design, planning or implementing the drone and prosthetic hand as a one entire system is our plan, and creating a bracket that will mount the PCB and prosthetic hand will be our next move. So for the constraints and risk analysis, what I did was I essentially took the biggest risks that were involved with the development of our project, mainly being time constraints, the overall cost, and the fabrication of the PCB itself. So for the fabrication of the PCB, essentially to mitigate this risk what we did was we built the breadboard prototype and now we know exactly what we need to put on the pcb for the overall cost we created a budget proposal that we submitted to dr wafa along with dr yakos and this was approved and for the time constraint we essentially choose the most important tasks that we needed to get done each week and we accomplished those tasks so that we would not fall behind in both hardware and software Overall, we conducted extensive research to make sure that we weren't infringing any uh, pat uh, existing patents or copyrights. Our project is relatively unique uh, with emphasis placed on the wireless capability of our uh, uh, prosthetic hand. Uh, we also ensured our project adhered to certain IEEE standards uh, like the RF exposure and 80215 Bluetooth technology, uh, sorry, standard for Bluetooth technology. Rather. Here are the references used in our presentation, and that is all. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, uh, I have a question, okay? Absolutely, Dr. Yakos. Yeah. Uh, the question is that uh, is missing under the constraints is missing the integration of the drone with the uh, gripper. In terms of uh, payload, the mm -hmm. drone has a payload and uh, has a power budgeting. So uh, you should do a feasibility study, how you're going to design the drone if you're planning to include this gripper into it this is very important part so yeah so we've actually we've started researching the components that would be used for the drone however the main emphasis this semester was towards the claw gripper and making ensuring that those components work before moving on to the drone portion because the our main uh, aspect is the claw gripper and the programming and some hardware that goes into that as opposed to the drone because of the fact that drone technology is relatively easy to get into and we didn't feel it was a good emphasis on showing that our, our knowledge of no, engineering. It's not easy. It's not easy since you're planning to evolve new, to change the payload. 
tailor this everything that you put on the drone. Correct. It's not easy. You, you have the power budgeting, which you didn't saw this part, how you integrate it with the drone. Please try to do it. Okay, try to do this part. And I will give you another application, which uh, this application is very important. You may want to apply this as such without using a drone for medical robotics. Medical robotics surgery is using this, uh, you know, these grippers to perform surgeries. Mm -hmm. So this is another option that you may want to consider. You understand you. what you think? Yeah, yes, this, yes, absolutely. Even, this is even more challenging and more uh, applicable. Medical robotic surgery, uh, having this gripper to perform uh, operations. Okay, any kind of operations from moving a tool, you know, to do right. more. Absolutely, research. absolutely. Okay, think well, about it. We should do some more research on it and we will hopefully, in the event, possibly include it in our design. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yakos. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I actually had a question. Hey, Michael. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering, I was just curious, because uh, I saw that there was uh, a cost of about like $750. Uh, is that the actual like final cost that's expected? Correct. Yes. That was through all the research we conducted, uh, give or take, for plus or minus a few dollars, uh, that's essentially how much it would cost to uh, produce our project from scratch. It's a very good project. Very, thank you very good. much, Dr. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Michael, Sebash.